enter your name, followed by hash. Thank you. The conference is now being recorded. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's presentation of the Fall 2015 North American Power Reference Case, an integrated view of the energy sector. This presentation will last one hour, and telephones will be muted for the duration. If you have questions, please submit them through the chat or the Q&A window in your WebEx screen. Today's speakers from the ABB Advisors team are Manager Tom Sweet, Consultant Garrick Hoops, Senior Consultant Kathy Jones, and Shilpa Kukate Consultant. And now Tom Sweet will begin this presentation. Well, thank you, Dana. Uh, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Sweet. I'm the uh, Reference Case Product Manager. And a little bit about our group, you know, we're responsible for producing the uh, Power Reference Case as well as any consulting uh, based on the reference case. So this includes uh, asset valuations, uh, market analysis, and uh, some custom scenarios. A little disclaimer before we uh, get into the presentation, uh, again, uh, the information presented here is, uh, can change without any notice, and uh, it's not to be construed as a commitment uh, by ABB. I want to bring up a little bit of some changes that we've had in our group. Uh, you know, historically, you, know, you might have referred to us as, as Ventix, uh, and we were the uh, energy market intelligence group in there uh, within uh, that group. Uh, we're now part of uh, ABB. And uh, a little bit about that, um, again, we've, um, you know, the question is, you know, why now? Well, again, you know, this is uh, all part of an integration that started with uh, ABB acquiring Ventix uh, back in 2010. And this is all part of uh, ABB's strategy to integrate IT and OT, in other words, the uh, information technology uh, which uh, uh, Ventix provides and the, the operational technology uh, which uh, ABB, um, you know, traditionally supplies. Uh, as a result of that, the, um, you know, the, the name Ventix uh, has, has been retired. And, uh, you know, one of the, the benefits of this is that, you know, we have a lot more uh, collaboration within ABB, and that's making our uh, reference case product uh, even stronger. You know, ABB is a, a significant player uh, in the uh, renewable uh, space, as well as providing uh, equipment to the uh, utility industry. Kind of putting this in, in a little bit about ABB, uh, it's a very large company. We have uh, almost 145,000 employees worldwide uh, with $42 billion in revenue. A uh, little bit of history, you know, ABB uh, was formed in 1988. Uh, with a merger of uh, a Swiss uh, company, uh, BBC, and a Swedish company, uh, ASEA. Uh, again, both these companies have, uh, you know, were, have well over 100 years of, uh, of experience. Within ABB, uh, our, um, uh, the enterprise software group uh, is in the power systems group. And again, this uh, graphic shows the you know, kind of the five main focuses of uh, ABB, and each product group is uh, approximately 20% of the company. Drilling down into uh, EPM uh, is that you know we have uh, you know, roughly uh, 250 employees. Uh, we actually uh, started back in uh, 1975 with uh, you know, where we introduced uh, the first. Uh, commercial optimization software for utilities, and uh, we've supported over uh, $5 billion worth of investment. Uh, drilling down a little further, you know, how do we fit in, you know, with the reference case into uh, EPM or in, uh, Energy Portfolio Management, uh, and the subset of which, which is EMI. Uh, EMI is this gray bar, and that includes both the uh, Velocity Suite uh, team, uh, it includes, um, you know, the, the reference case, uh, simulation data, and then, of course, we have consulting uh, at the very top. So, uh, again, these uh, reports and data services coupled with our consulting group is uh, EMI uh, or the uh, Energy Market Intelligence 
group. Okay, I'm going to go a little bit uh, through our uh, agenda and, uh, again, go through uh, an introduction. Uh, and then we're going to spend uh, a, a large part of our time uh, talking about, uh, you know, the methodology, uh, discuss emissions, uh, renewables, natural gas and coal, uh, and then get into uh, some of the results of our, our base case and scenarios. And then uh, finally I'll, I'll wrap up with uh, a description of the, the reference case. So the, uh, the reference case, you know, well, really, what is it? Well, very simply, uh, the ABB case is a, a long-term forecast of the North American energy markets. Uh, in that, you know, we look at uh, the interaction between, you know, fuel supply and demand. Uh, we look at environmental regulation, at the uh, thermal additions, any renewable additions. Uh, we look at uh, retirements. And all that is used to develop a forecast uh, for all the different markets. Um, you know, our models are supply and demand driven, uh, so they're fundamental in nature. And we have over, you know, 80 clients across North America representing buyers and sellers and, uh, you know, uh, owners of, of assets. Um, it is unbiased and independent. Uh, and, and finally, you know, we use uh, our own software and uh, data products. So, again, we use a ProMod for developing our final prices and, of course, uh, Velocity Suite to help feed a lot of the uh, – uh, our to, heat, to feed our fundamental models. Now, um, ABB, you know, why should you choose us for our reference case? Well, again, there's, uh, you know, a lot of other consulting firms use uh, our software products. Uh, but they don't have the benefit of a proprietary model that we have. It's the integrated model where we can look at the interaction of all the different markets, and I'll talk about that in a little while. Uh, but also we have, uh, you know, uh, access to Velocity Suite, uh, and again, we can get to uh, a lot more information and have a lot more of a streamlined interface uh, between the Velocity Suite data and our software tools. Um, We've also been doing this a long time. Uh, the reference case, uh, our first reference case was for the WEC, uh, which started in the uh, spring of uh, 2000. Uh, but then by fall, we expanded that to all of North America, and we've been producing on that uh, semi-annual cycle uh, ever since. Uh, also, you know, we uh, do a pretty good job of forecasting. Uh, again, a uh, couple of points here. Uh, back in, uh, you know, for the 2017-18 the PGM capacity auction, uh, we were, you know, we successfully forecasted that, you know, almost to the, the nearest dollar, uh, as well as the uh, Reggie uh, CO2 auction. Again, uh, these were, you know, some fairly fundamental shifts in the market, especially with the Reggie, where they were significantly changing the, the targets, and we were able to, um, you know, to, to uh, properly forecast the, the movement in the market as well as the magnitude of that. Um, and also, you know, again, integration is the key. And as I mentioned, by being part of, um, you know, the, having the data, the software, as well as the uh, consulting expertise, you know, we're, we're, we are very well suited to producing the reference case. Okay, moving into the, uh, the methodology and overview. You know, as, as I mentioned before, uh, we receive a lot of information from uh, Velocity Suite. So again, uh, you know, from the, you know, we get uh, loads for all the balancing authorities across North America, uh, all the generating unit characteristics. Again, since we're a fundamental model, you know, tens of thousands of uh, resources are modeled. Uh, we have uh, also information on, you know, coal supply and gas supply and demand. Again, we're a fundamental model, so we look at, you know, the supply characteristics, the uh, transportation between the supply and the demand nodes. Um, you know, we have information on the electric uh, transmission uh, topology. Uh, so all this information gets fed into our integrated model. And again, this is a proprietary model for ABB. 
And uh, the nice thing about this model is that, you know, we consider the interaction between, you know, the electric market, uh, the natural gas markets, coals, uh, interaction with emissions, capacity, and renewables. So, you know, think about it as, well, again, in, and you'll see some of these examples uh, in the uh, clean power plant scenario where you're having a significant change in the um, consumption of fuels in the, in the U.S., Again, a lot less coal is being burnt, a lot more natural gas is being uh, consumed. That interaction, at least you know, on the gas side, uh, feeds into the gas model, and we get uh, a much higher price. So that feeds into the energy module. Similarly, on the coal side, less demand, lower prices. So that affects the overall economics, and that's reflected in our integrated tool. Some of the outputs of the model, uh, again, we get capacity additions. Again, in the short term, uh, any announced additions we consider, but we're a 25-year model. So as resources are retired uh, and load grows, uh, we need to uh, add resources. <laughs> we consider retirements. Uh, again, any announced. Uh, we consider age-based retirements. And also from an economic perspective, if uh, a resource is losing money four more years in a row, uh, we retire it. Uh, retrofits, in the case of some environmental modeling, uh, we also have prices. So we produce capacity prices, uh, fuel prices, emission, and rec prices. All this information is then fed into ProMod uh, to produce our final uh, electric prices. At this point, you know, I should have mentioned it earlier, uh, if you want to uh, ask any questions, please use your chat window. All right, just a real quick summary of what's happened since uh, 2015, uh, the spring release. Um, again, we have, uh, you know, CASPER and, uh, has been reproposed, and that revises uh, NOx allocations. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, EPA, uh, we have changes in the MATS ruling. Uh, the Clean Power Plan was finalized. Um, we have lower oil and gas prices. Uh, due to um, cost reductions in the U.S. Uh, again, there's also a, a global glut of LNG, and that's rather than uh, looking at exports of LNG, uh, we're now looking at shifting gas to uh, Mexico. And all this is putting you know, a, lot, a lot more pressure on coal units, <laughs> excuse me, with an additional three gigawatts of announced retirements. Quick summary of the uh, peak forecast. Again, it's it's declining. Uh, back in fall 2008, you can see the trajectory of our forecast. Uh, so by fall of 15, again, essentially this is pre-recession. Uh, now here we are in today's environment. Again, uh, the magnitude is down. Also, the slope is lower. We've going we're moving from about a 1.4 percent annual growth rate down to about a 0.8 percent. Excuse me. A little bit of uh, a highlight of the market developments. Again, uh, increased transparency. Again, all the ISOs are working to resolve seams and uh, receives issues and coordinate electric and gas systems. Uh, the footprint is changing. Uh, again, we have WAPA uh, joining SPP, um, and then also in the in the WEC in the energy imbalance market. Uh, again, we've got uh, Nevada Energy and, and Puget Sound. Uh, looking to join the EIM in um, uh, 2016, uh, Portland General in 2017. Uh, we also have uh, APS looking at, uh, they're studying joining the EIM. Uh, also on the CAISO side, uh, we're looking at Pacific Corp joining. Um, market structure, again, uh, all of our markets uh, have a similar structure and um, we can then, uh, at this point, uh, I will now uh, turn over the uh, discussion to uh, Kathy Jones, and she will uh, discuss uh, emissions. Thank you, Tom. Give me a second here, and I will get my laser pointer going. So good, af good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Just want to give you a high-level overview of what we're seeing occurring in the emission markets in North America. So uh, as Tom mentioned, CASPER uh, has been uh, revised because, uh, you know, the, the court sent CASPER back to, the, to EPA, 
And so EPA then revised uh, their budget as part of that. And so uh, it's not going to be vacated. I believe it's going to stay in place as is. However, those revised budgets are open for comment. Our fall reference case also reflects the increase in California to a 40% reduction from 1990 emission levels by the 2030 timeframe. That's something that was just recently uh, instituted by the, the governor when he signed the, the Senate Bill 350. We also reflect the fact that California and Quebec are holding joint auctions for carbon emissions, as well as uh, the CO2 taxes in BC and Alberta. Alberta just recently uh, increased their carbon tax, and our fall reference case reflects that uh, increase. We also do a Reggie emission market price forecast, as Tom mentioned, and uh, we do that by looking at the emission levels of each of the states as well as Reggie overall to make a determination uh, with our integrated model as to what the uh, emission price would be, what the carbon price would be. <clears throat> and then uh, as part of this fall reference case, we did include a clean power plan uh, building block scenario. So the building block scenario really reflects not instituting a carbon tax, but having an implied carbon tax, and I'll get into that in more detail. Uh, so uh, that's compliance with the building block. So then conversely, on the other side, we did a clean power plan carbon tax scenario where compliance was attained through the implementation of a, a, a U.S. carbon cap and trade scheme. So as I mentioned, uh, the CASPER was revised by, by the EPA, and this particular map shows you what CASPER looked like uh, from, from the original. And you can see that there's 28 states here that were affected by the original CASPER. However, um, <clears throat> just a, I think it was just last month, EPA then released their CASPER proposed rule. And what you see here are the, the new 23 states that, CAS, that the EPA have identified as part of the CASPER program. Essentially, this is eliminating uh, Florida as well as Georgia from, from the NOx. And as you can see, too, really um, EPA in this prior graphic uh, is really now addressing CASPER not from a SO2 perspective, but from a NOx and particulate matter perspective to prevent the uh, downwind and upwind leakages. This was a graph provided by EPA that shows the downwind and upwind leakages between the states. So this will ha was not reflected in our fall reference case because it came out so late, but this will have an impact on our NOx forecast going forward because of those revised 2017 budgets that the EPA released. So I want to move on to the clean power plan. This particular map just shows you uh, on a, based on a variation in color. So the darker the color, the higher the reduction that the state has to attain by 2030. So you can see in the uh, really dark blue uh, colors, those are the states that are having to attain anywhere from 41 to 50 percent. And then you can see as the colors lighten up, uh, are the reductions. So, like, for instance, you see California and Idaho are in very low light blue colors. So that shows you that their carbon reduction emission targets are, are much lower. So it gradually decreases in the blue colors. And also, too, you can see that Vermont up there in the upper left uh, is gray. And so Vermont and D.C. were excluded from the CPP. And that's simply because currently they do not produce of carbon emissions. <clears throat> so I mentioned that we did two scenarios, one via building blocks and one with a carbon tax. So I wanted to step you through our building blocks. So uh, some of these build, the EPA specified three building blocks. However, we wanted to expand it because really energy efficiency is kind of like low hanging fruit and, and one of the lower cost alternatives for compliance by reducing the amount of megawatt hours of generation that would be required. So we, um, <clears throat> oh, can you hear me now, Dana? Yeah, we so, can hear you. It's just a bit soft, so maybe just so closer to your receiver. Thank okay. you. So um, as part of these building blocks, 
we did a redispatch on the coal and natural gas uh, combined cycle units. That was one of the blocks that EPA identified. And so really by doing that redispatch, we are uh, artificially not changing the dispatch price, but we are backing down coal in the dispatch order as well as increasing natural gas in the dispatch order. So they're moving them is up and down the stack. For energy efficiency, we didn't target all areas because some areas already uh, exceed what EPA was suggesting for energy efficiency. And so overall, we're targeting a 4.7% reduction from energy efficiency. And EPA initially had said that they were expecting 28% of the resource mix to come from renewable energy. Uh, based on our building blocks, uh, renewable energy constitutes about 25% of the capacity mix. And then we also targeted retirements. We targeted retirements based on, one, the age of the unit, two, the size of the unit, and three, the emission uh, controls and profitability of those resources. So in addition, because we've added all the renewable energy and had these targeted retirements, we then uh, looked at where we had congestion and where EPA was suggesting that that congestion would occur, and we uh, had incremental additions for our transmission system as far as the transfers between, uh, <clears throat> between the regions. So what was the impact of those building blocks on the production cost? So uh, as I said, we had all of our building blocks. So you can see that energy efficiency on a do dollar per megawatt hour basis doesn't have much of an impact on the, uh, and what you see here I meant to mention first is that Positive numbers are a reduction in production costs. Negative numbers are an increase in production costs. So as you see with the energy efficiency, you don't have much of an, in a decrease in production costs. However, with the redispatch and retirements, you can see that that's actually increasing production costs. But the biggest bang for your buck is really on the uh, renewable uh, generation and that's being driven from the fact that you're displacing fuel costs. Yes, you might have higher incremental fixed O&M, but that displacement of the fuel cost is overridden uh, or is not enough to uh, override the increase in the fixed O&M for the production cost. And then you can see that overall the expectation in 2030 is that you know, production costs would be down by approximately $5 a megawatt hour. So what was the impact on uh, emissions for these? Now, I, I want to clarify here that this particular graphic shows emissions for the power sector only and also for all sources. So it's not targeting new source performance standards or new source perform existing source performance standards or new source performance standards. Um, <clears throat> it's, so therefore then, uh, you can see the base case compared to the EPA, uh, EPP, which was the building blocks, versus the carbon tax. So with the building blocks overall emissions, you're seeing uh, more of a reduction from the building blocks than you do from the CO2 tax case. But the other takeaway here is that post-2030, you can see that all three lines continue to go back up. So therefore, that reflects the reduction or increase in carbon emissions post-2030 of the nuclear plant retirement. So that gives you some idea of the impact uh, that the zero emission technologies have on being able to comply with the CPP post-2030. So as I said, on the production cost, now let's look at the emissions reduction. You, of course, all building blocks are going to give you an emission reduction, but you can see that energy efficiency and redispatch don't give you as much of a bang for your buck compared to renewables and retirements. So overall, retirements are really going to give you the largest emission reductions with renewables coming in very close second. And we did do considerable additions of renewable uh, capacity to attain these uh, reductions. So what's next with the Clean Power Plan? Uh, EPA has released their federal implementation plan. It, was, it came out in the Federal Register, so it is open for comments. 
and comments are due by January 21st. The, they haven't said yet whether they would do a mass or a race-based method or if they would give states the option. Uh, every indication is that they're going to do one or the other and that they may be leaning toward a mass-based method simply because that's going to be much easier to administer and then it would institute more like a cap and trade. Um, then also, too, as part of that federal implementation plan, they also finalized the Clean Energy Incentive Program, or the SEEP. So that same comment period is still open as well for the SEEP. And the expectation is that they will finalize the cap and trade scheme by uh, summer of 2016. So with those comment periods being open through January 2016 and states having to file their state implementation plan by September 2016, it's going to be a very tight schedule as far as EPA finalizing that federal implementation plan before states have to submit their initial plan. So of course, um, everybody is, is challenging. This is the, the existing source performance standards is probably one of the most uh, challenged rulings that EPA has ever had. I think of all of the 50 states, Everybody has come in from one side or the other except for four states, and with the majority being on, of course, the dissenting side. So what the D.C. courts did is they consolidated all of the challenges uh, uh, under the West Virginia et al. So if you want to follow it, follow the West Virginia, and that will be a consolidation of all the challenges. But in, on the other side of the coin, you also have states that came in in defense of the rule. And so, of course, that's going to be California, some of the Northeast states. But in addition, it was also Vermont and Hawaii, which aren't even subject to the existing source performance rule. And it's still open yet as to whether the D.C. courts will stay the decision until all the comments and challenges have been heard to uh, reduce the burden of implementation costs before everything uh, goes into play. And of course, there have been challenges also on the new source performance standards, which would then preclude EPA instituting the existing source performance standards. So it's being challenged from, from multiple fronts. As well as Congress, uh, they have passed two, re the House and Senate both passed resolutions with some Republican support. However, they did not get enough votes to override a veto. And the administration has said uh, on numerous occasions that if they attempted these resolutions, that they would be vetoed. <clears throat> so hopefully you can hear me better now. <laughs> uh, but we're going to move on to renewables. And um, just to give you a high-level overview, one of the things that's come up uh, in the past few years, of course, is distributed solar generation. It's really, you know, been a game changer, particularly in California, as you can see in the Pacific contiguous. But what this particular graphic shows you is the generation increases that we're seeing across the different regions in the U.S. from distributed solar generation. So it's not just a California issue anymore. Really, we're looking at um, <clears throat> we're really looking at you know, increases in New England, even though it's much smaller portion, but New England had the largest increase uh, overall than the other regions. So this is going to be something that's going to have a significant impact, at least uh, going forward, on how uh, the ISOs address distributed solar, as well as the pricing for net metering and the fixed cost for net metering. So moving on to the renewable status and assumptions. Of course, there's been no progress from a federal perspective other than the EPA uh, building blocks with the renewable port with the renewable standards in there. Uh, so there's really nothing going on on the federal front from that perspective. We have had some movement on the states that have a renewable portfolio standard. So West Virginia repealed their RPS. Uh, California increased their RPS to 50%. And that is reflected in our fall reference case. Vermont increased their RPS to 75% by 2032. That's also reflected in our um, fall reference case. But 
honorable mention goes to Kansas, the state of Kansas here, where they did not repeal theirs, but they, they made it a voluntary since they had already met their uh, RPS requirements. And uh, in development of our renewable energy credits, we do assume that states are going to be able to trade these credits across states, so we don't really have you know, a specific state-by-state uh, -state RET market. But, um, but by meeting that California RPS requirement at 50%, um, we really, by the end of the forecast period in 2040, were at a level where California was meeting its demand from in-state resources by 100% uh, by from in-state resources by 2040. So as I mentioned, we have seen um, some RPS modifications. So what you see here in blue are the states that have had modifications, not necessarily trying to repeal. It could be either an increase, decrease, or, or, or stay the course. And so this just tells you how much uh, states are really continually evaluating their RPS standards, and that too is coming from, you know, we've got lower natural gas prices, so that's putting some further push on the RPS requirements from an from a economic perspective. However, even though we have that push from a gas natural, lower natural gas perspective, what you see here are the uh, capacity additions by fuel type, and you can see that by looking at the bottom two bars for wind and solar, that again, 2015 is on track to where a renewable resources will be uh, greater than the addition of your traditional resources. So even with lower natural gas prices, the addition of renewables are continuing to exceed the addition of your traditional uh, capacity. And this just gives you an idea of what's included in our wind and solar pipeline. Uh, so our, our reference case in the, in the fall 2015, we include in the new entrance if, uh, any renewables that are under construction or are, in, or are in the permitted phase. You can see that there's a definite uplift for wind and solar both in the 2016 timeframe. And this includes a lot of proposed of wind and solar that really haven't broke ground yet. So they would not necessarily qualify for uh, the production tax credit uh, or get the 30 percent ITC in 2016 because that's going to drop off to 10 in 2017. But you can see how that pipeline starts to dwindle after the 2016 time frame. And that's really being driven from uh, some uncertainty as to whether uh, there's going to be any tax extenders. I would now like to turn it over to Garrett Suits for a discussion on natural gas and coal. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon and good morning. Uh, thanks, Kathy. Um, yeah, my name is Garrett uh, Hoops, uh, and I lead our um, <clears throat> fuel forecasting effort for the reference case. And uh, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking here about uh, coal and gas, as they are pretty critical inputs to the the uh, reference case modeling. So first I'm going to talk about a, a little bit about um, uh, uh, fundamentals, um, what's kind of what's going on in the market uh, in general right now, and then uh, I'll cover our forecast at a, at a pretty high level. Um, so first chart here looks at uh, storage. Um, uh, working working in towards the U.S. natural gas uh, through um, November 20th, uh, and highlights the range and average um, average with the being the dark blue line there in the middle. Um, the falling blue line is the Henry Hub price and corresponds to the right-hand axis. Um, so since the beginning of summer, gas storage has basically been building uh, from the five-year average. And when you look back to 2014, uh, the bottom of in inventories in 2014 was 822 BCF, um, which you can see here in the, on the, at the, that 
trough uh, in the light blue line uh, on the left-hand side of the chart uh, compared to this year's bottom of 1467. So there's a difference there of uh, 645 BCF, um, average over 120-day winter heating season, that's 5 BCFD. So um, a lot uh, more gas in, in inventories um, after the 2015 winter um, than the previous winter, even though it was fairly cold. So that reflects higher production um, uh, and and um, to some degree lower utilization, uh, though the, the, the biggest driver there is higher production. Um, and predictive, predictably, as production has continued to increase uh, after the mild summer, uh, this, this summer, um, uh, prices have fallen from the 280 level or so uh, to, to down near two dollars, and actually today um, breaking a dollar eighty. Um, so unless production growth flattens, uh, and this winter is substantially colder than normal, both of those uh, being the case, uh, being unlikely to be the case, um, uh, the, the NOAA's uh, forecast uh, for long term. Uh, weather is, is showing warmer than average in the in the high um, gas demand areas, uh, the northeast and the Midwest. Um, Prices will continue to experience downward pressure in the coming months. So, looking at the production situation, uh, U.S. natural gas production has increased 28 percent since 2010, from 58. Uh, BCFD to 74 BCFD in 2015. Growth from shale gas uh, is the largest driver, increasing over 26 BCFD since two, 2010. Um, this chart depicts monthly average uh, production by shale, play, uh, and overall dry gas production from the EIA. Um, and dry gas production, production has been in modest decline. Uh, sorry, excuse me, dry, dry shale gas production has been in modest decline since April. Um, however, total shale gas or total dry gas production has continued to increase. This appears to be primarily a result of conventional production from the Gulf of Mexico and Texas, which is likely to be transitory, um, given the state of drilling activity. Um, we believe that the decline in shale gas production. Uh, we are at the very beginning of a tightening process in the markets so that's likely to become more prevalent um, towards the end and after 2016. Um, this next chart we're, we're looking at um, sort of rationalizes crude uh, UK uh, natural gas prices and uh, on the MBP um, and then uh, Henry Hub natural gas prices. Um, it's not adjusted for inflation, however. Um, oil prices continue to be under pressure, under pressure as OPEC has now essentially committed to maintaining production at about 31 and a half million barrels per day, uh, which according to IEA data um, would require an additional um, 475,000 barrels per day of cuts outside OPEC to rebalance the market by this time next year. Um, beyond That's beyond the almost million barrels per day, one million barrels per day that would be required um, to be cut from non-OPEC supply. So, the, but uh, the low price environment has had the effect of forcing um, U.S. tight oil and similarly shale gas producers to drastically improve efficiency and cut costs. Uh, there are a significant portion of this cost cutting that that won't necessarily translate um, once the market rebalances and idle capital begins to see higher utilization, um, but there's a significant portion um, that will remain. Um, and uh, though oil prices are still technically within the range of break-even costs of 35 to $80, dollars, our research indicates that the bulk of tight oil produ producers are well within the probably the lower half of that range in 2015. Uh, those mentioned above, some uplifting costs is expected as idle oil and gas services come back to, into utilization. Um, moving on to a brief uh, look at our, our uh, North American um, forecast. Um, we're looking at here is our de gas demand forecast. Uh, power generation is projected to increase about almost uh, power 
excuse me, gas demand for power generation is projected to increase almost 30 or 80 percent from 2015 levels. Um, how the power sector gas demand growth is expected to drive half of overall gas demand growth to 2040. So that's about half the picture. Um, Gas demand from the residential, commercial, industrial sectors is projected to grow 11.3 percent. Most of that, or actually all of that growth, is, is coming from industrial demand, um, uh, primarily in the 2016 to 2024 period, um, with a, a number of large petrochemical projects um, uh, uh, coming online, as well as some uh, additional demand from uh, <clears throat> the Canadian uh, tar sands. Um, Mexican demand for pipeline imports is expected to increase significantly by 2040, uh, and as well as um, North American LNG exports, which are expected to grow to 8.7 uh, BCFD by 2025, and most of that um, is is in uh, the, the Gulf Coast region. Uh, moving on to our supply forecast, uh, our view continues to be that unconventional production, uh, shale and tight gas um, are the incremental supply sources for North American gas markets um, with production growing at the rate that replaces conventional uh, production losses and meets an increasing demand. Um, the development of the Marcellus and associated Utica and Huron Shale formations will be the biggest single supply driver over the forecast time frame, and it is important to note that a major study um, of the resource base uh, conducted um, in the in the Utica shale in particular uh, that was conducted by a consortium of academic institutions and federal agencies found that the that formation, which underlies large portions of the Marcellus formations that significantly greater depth um, contains mean uh, technically recoverable resources of 1700 or 717 um, trillion cubic feet which is on par really with the resource potential estimates uh, for the Marcellus um, so we're talking about another Marcellus uh, essentially uh, in the Utica potentially um, the cost structure is really the big uncertainty right now, uh, and it may take some time to sort of um, uh, firm that up. Um, so our Henry Hub forecast uh, is shown here. Um, we're, we're looking at comparison between the spring 2015 and the fall 2015, uh, as well as the EIA's uh, annual energy outlook um, from from this uh, from this April, um, it's important to mention that we do use the NYMEX futures for both Henry Hub and for our basis hub forecasts for the first 24 months. Then we blend our fundamental forecast for the second 24 months. Um, the reduction in the price forecast beyond the near term is a primarily a result of the average. Um, 10% uh, or so reduction in break-even costs we've included across producing regions, as well as a lower and slower development of the LNG forecast. <clears throat> so pipeline projects, and we did have a question on this uh, a little earlier. Um, so these are the pipeline projects we've added for the fall case. Um, our general um, pr procedure is to add pipeline projects um, to our pipeline um, database once uh, they they come into the pre-filing pro pro uh, process uh, with FERC. Um, the, we do make a few exceptions to that, um, and in the Northeast, we've generally taken the tack of rather than using um, the a project stated um, capacity um, we use uh, only what they what they uh, a project actually gets contracted for so for instance um, here in the blue you can see the Northeast Energy Direct uh, pipeline um, for with the Tennessee gas uh, TGB uh, project um, that that has a, a, a Potential of three BCFD, um, the, but the contracting as of um, uh, the, from the from the open season as of uh, September was only at um, 650 mm CFD. So that is the 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 number that we've included in terms of the capacity for that pipeline. Um, our 
pipeline model is an aggregated um, uh, model, so we don't model individual pipes, um, but we do bundles of pipes that go from one hub to another. Uh, and and we do also add uh, generic pipeline capacity based on the construction costs uh, and le or levelized construction costs um, and 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 pricing um, in the latter uh, part of the uh, the uh, forecast time frame. Uh, I need to move quickly through the next uh, few slides here, so I apologize for running a little bit behind. Um, <clears throat> What we're looking at here are gas uh, demand changes under the clean power plant scenario, and the, basically the takeaway here is um, that in the blue, the blue uh, lines represent the the building block case or the clean power plant case, and the the gray lines and bars represent the net change in in demand in and power and change in power demand in gas for gas uh, in the CO2 price or tax case as have you choose to, to call it. Um, the bottom line is that um, the net changes uh, don't have a huge impact on um, Henry Hub prices, uh, and nor do they materially affect uh, the build out of the required build out of tra gas transmission capacity, um, sort of in the longer run. Um, moving on to coal. Um, we're down uh, year to date uh, through quarter three uh, from uh, in terms of power sector coal consumption by about 10 percent, concentrated pretty highly in the Midwest and Southeast. Um, coal production is down um, estimated 100 million tons this year, um, which is right about in the middle of the range that we called in the spring. Um, Appalachia uh, continues to, to really see uh, suffer um, in the current low gas environment, um, but as you can see, uh, coal production is down uh, across the board. Um, looking at our forecast, uh, this is the base case forecast. Um, it, we're, we're looking at uh, relatively flat uh, coal demand um, with some recovery, you know, t t uh, from uh, in in uh, corresponding with uh, increases in natural gas prices um, in, in, in into the early 2020s, uh, and then lastly look at our the cold demand changes in our clean power pan clean, clean power plant scenarios. The the darker blue line is the clean power plant building blocks uh, case, and the the lighter blue line is the CO2 tax case. Um, uh, basically, we we see uh, uh, essentially 20 to 30 percent lower uh, coal demand uh, under the clean power plan uh, cases um, compared to the base case demand of about 800 million tons uh, in 2030 uh, with implementation of the clean power plan. And with that, um, thanks for your time, and I'm going to pass it to uh, Shilpa Kokate uh, to talk about um, our power. Uh, modeling results. Thank you, Garrick. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Shilpa. I will be presenting a few results from our fall reference case. And uh, this first chart is the cumulative capacity additions across North America in gigawatts. Uh, what you can clearly see here is that gas additions, meaning combined cycle and gas turbines, they lead the pack, uh, which means by the end of our forecast, which is 2040, we're talking about over 300 gigawatts of gas additions. That's then followed by renewables, which amounts to around 76, 77 gigawatts by the end of forecast. Um, that's a little higher compared to what was reported in our previous reference case, um, and that's purely reflecting our assumptions as, as far as renewables go um, in, in terms of improving economics for both solar and wind units. Um, on the other hand, coal, hydro, nuclear additions are going to be flat, especially coal. Uh, there's not going to be much movement because right now we have low natural gas prices um, and they're going to continue to exert downward pressure on coal. Moving on to the regional resource mix, again, this is gigawatt across five different regions. Um, 
If we look at the Midwest and the Southeast regions, um, what you'll see on this particular chart is um, by the end of the forecast, which is 2040, it displays fewer coal units and uh, the slack is definitely going to be picked up by gas-fired assets. Uh, so we are talking about over 450 gigawatts of gas additions in both these regions. Northeast, again, you notice gas-fired units are dominating, so about 48 gigawatts by the end of the forecast. But what's unique about Northeast is it also has quite a few dual-fired units, both oil and gas units, although by the end of the forecast, the number of these units goes down. Uh, wet region is where you actually see the highest number of um, renewables being added. Um, it's pretty significant. We're talking about 83 gigawatts by the end of the forecast. While we focus on ERCOT, um, again, there's been significant additions of renewable resources, um, and most of them is wind, as uh, Kathy already indicated in one of her slides. Um, in fact, wind turbines are being um, added significantly in ERCOT, and they lead the nation. Um, we're talking about of about approximately 19 gigawatts by 2016 in the state of Texas. Um, this is just a generic description of uh, the additional scenarios that we do provide in addition to the base case run. Uh, we have the low gas scenario as well as the high gas scenario. Uh, the low gas scenario is basically our subjective view of the 10th percentile value of a probability distribution. Essentially what it means is we tend to create multipliers for both these cases, the high gas and the low gas, and they're generated by stochastic analysis of historical prices. So the low gas case is going to represent the 10th percentile value, while the high gas case is going to represent the 90th percentile value. Uh, the EPA clean power plant scenario, Kathy has already discussed in detail the building blocks that we use, the five building blocks. So essentially, that's what that particular scenario is all about. And finally, we also did a carbon tax scenario, which reflects a carbon tax in the United States. Um, in that particular scenario, we also modified uh, gas prices and coal prices um, to reflect the change in demand across all, our sec all the sectors. Um, what about Henry Hub gas price forecast? Um, this particular chart basically shows a comparison of Henry Hub gas price forecast in $2015 per MMBTU across all the scenarios when compared to base. Um, as mentioned before, the high, the high gas and the low gas cases, they were developed using stochastic multipliers. Uh, they basically are intended to represent high and low cost gas resource cases uh, or uh, on the supply side, it's basically low and high resource cases. And then what, what you can clearly see on this particular chart is the CPP case and the CO2 price or the CO2 tax case. Um, you don't see a lot of variation in gas price forecast uh, in these two when you compare it against the base case. And that primarily is um, because of the, uh, the slide that Garrick explained to you where he showed uh, the change in demand from the power sector under these two scenarios. And finally, um, this is the 7 by 24 power price forecast in $2015 per megawatt hour, uh, comparison, of ba comparison of power prices in the base when compared to the remaining scenario. So in the base, um, gas uh, power prices um, by the end of the forecast were at around $55, while in the high gas case it's around $76. Um, in the national CO2 case, where you see the impact of national CO2 tax, um, in this particular case, uh, the, the CO2 tax uh, actually kicks in starting 2022, which is where you notice uh, the spike in all our, our 7 by 24 power prices in that particular scenario. With that, I am going to ask Tom to take over. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Shilpa. Okay, everyone, um, now I'm going to uh, discuss a little bit about the reference case. So uh, again, the reference case uh, is packaged in uh, five different reports. Uh, we have uh, five separate regions. Uh, we have a, a northeast, 
a Midwest, a Southeast, an ERCOT, and a WEC report. And for the uh, regions in the Eastern Interconnect, there's some overlap in the reporting, uh, namely as the ISOs grew and uh, the, uh, the market structure changed, uh, you know, we um, needed to have some overlap in the reports. Now, um, you know, in each of the reports, you get a, uh, a very comprehensive overview of all the different markets. Um, you also get a, a set of results files that have uh, the very detailed forecast results. Um, and also, you get a, um, a monthly uh, short-term update of, of all the forecasts. So the, uh, the forecasts, uh, again, you see we have uh, 74 market areas uh, across the um, North America. And in each of these market areas, you know, some you receive uh, hourly electric uh, energy and annual capacity prices. Again, when we uh, run all our information from our, our preprocessor and feed it in a ProMod, uh, we do produce uh, 8760 prices going out uh, 25 years. Um, so again, you get these uh, hourly prices summarized on a typical week basis. Uh, we also, uh, for each of the market areas, provide, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the annual capacity additions. Uh, what resources are retired or retrofitted. Uh, again, a lot of detail on the gas side, so you get uh, monthly natural gas prices, uh, including uh, 30 uh, liquid market centers. Uh, you get delivered coal prices as well as a basin uh, freight on board price, uh, reporting of reserve margins and resource mix. So again, you get all this detail for each one of those points or those market areas uh, on the prior graph. And then at a regional basis, you know, we have uh, annual emission prices, uh, REC forecasts. Uh, again, I want to mention we have uh, a base case and actually multiple scenarios. This time we're going with uh, four scenarios because we're looking at uh, two uh, environmental uh, scenarios. And then as I mentioned, we have a, uh, a short-term 24-month uh, forecast where we uh, bring in the uh, uh, short term, uh, the, the next 24 months of uh, the NYMEX gas price, feed that into uh, our models to see what that impact is, you know, uh, what the, the market price of natural gas, this impact will be on uh, electric power prices. A little bit about the report. Uh, it's organized in uh, six chapters, uh, again, and the, uh, the chapters follow, you know, the, you know, kind of the layout of this, uh, this webcast. <clears throat> you know, we have an overview of the, the North American power trends. Uh, we go into some regional specifics, uh, talk about the fuel markets, uh, renewable, and emissions. Uh, we also have appendices, uh, again, and all the information in the appendices, you know, and more is actually included in the uh, results uh, Excel files that are, are sent to you. A little bit about the uh, the results that we provide. Uh, again, they're multi-tab files. So again, we uh, summarize for, uh, again, the base case, uh, the clean power plan, uh, the various uh, carbon tax results, high gas, low gas, uh, typical weeks. Uh, we have, you know, the short-term uh, forecast uh, by month, and then we have the hourly MCPs. So again, uh, a tremendous amount of data. Uh, and some of the information contained on the, uh, the tabs, uh, again, on the, the base results tab, you know, we go into, again, a lot of detail. Capacity mix, the initial entry, uh, talk about all the additions, retirements, you know, break it out by renewables, uh, load forecast. Load and resources is kind of an important table. It shows the, uh, essentially the reserve margin over time uh, for each of those 74 market areas. Uh, we summarize the, the fuel prices, emission costs, um, um, monthly um, clearing prices uh, for, or the marginal clearing prices, in other words, the electric prices. Uh, so again, a uh, tremendous amount of detail is provided, uh, which um, you know, is very helpful in your analyses. A little bit about the schedule. Again, I, I mentioned at the very start of this talk that, you know, we produce the uh, reference case uh, twice a year. 
so there's a fairly regular schedule uh, of um, around the reference case. Uh, we release in the uh, the first week of November in May. So back on November 6th, uh, we release the uh, results of uh, the reference case. Uh, we then followed that with a, uh, a two hour long uh, client or subscriber specific uh, webcast uh, where we go into a lot more detail than what, uh, what was shown today. Uh, we have, of course, the uh, the general uh, reference case webcast where we present an overview of the results uh, for um, for everyone. Um, then the uh, cycle for uh, the spring release now starts. So then in, uh, in March we're going to have a pre-release webcast where we're going to talk about some of the assumptions that uh, are being made for the upcoming spring release. Uh, and then again the, the process starts uh, continuing. Uh, the release of the results, uh, subscriber webcast, the reference case webcast, uh, also have some uh, regional workshops, and um, again, so a fairly regular cycle uh, of the uh, release of the, the reference case. I want to mention some additional services. Uh, again, the uh, around the reference case, uh, we do provide uh, asset valuation and any uh, market analysis uh, for uh, for individuals. Uh, so we can evaluate uh, any of the resources, uh, either existing or proposed, in any of the markets. Uh, we rely on uh, the ABB tools uh, and uh, help evaluate the, the market risks for your assets. Uh, also, one thing that a lot of uh, our uh, clients use when they do an asset valuation, uh, they do a custom scenario. You know, uh, they might have some uh, a slightly different view of how the uh, uh, the future might uh, uh, play out. Uh, so we can, you know, since we have all these fundamental models, it's you know it can be um, you know it's it's um, not a difficult task to incorporate that in our um, you know to uh, incorporate that in our model and develop uh, new prices. Um, now the the reference case is a zonal model. In other words, we have a very simplified representation of the uh, electric system. Again, we essentially have just 74 uh, nodes in the system and an equivalent transmission between them. Uh, but we also have a, a nodal group uh, headed by uh, uh, Keith Smith. And uh, again, they have a very detailed representation of the transmission system uh, so they can evaluate um, you know, again, the uh, the price at a specific a point, a LNP price. Uh, they can evaluate congestion, uh, and uh, again, get a, a more refined uh, electric price for a resource, particularly in a uh, a remote area. Uh, we also have an integrated resource planning group uh, headed by uh, Eric Hughes. Uh, so again, if you uh, need a, a detailed analysis of a, a large portfolio in a particular region, uh, we can help you there. And then finally, you know, as a res uh, kind of as a um, you think of a um, progression of information. Uh, after we produce the reference case, this information is then uh, shared with uh, uh, Rick Hunt who then um, produces a uh, simulation-ready uh, data package. So for uh, individuals who, subs who uh, license our ProMod product, uh, they can also receive uh, a database so they could do their own uh, analyses. Uh, finally, I want to try to direct everyone to uh, our Energy Market Intelligence website. Uh, and that's a nice site. I mean, you can uh, go out there. We have uh, various white papers, blog posts, uh, a lot of information about, um, you know, what is happening in the marketplace. Uh, also on that site, we uh, have information about webcasts, uh, upcoming webcasts uh, that you can attend. So finally, uh, if you have uh, any questions, uh, you can uh, direct them to uh, uh, Gina Melson, uh, and uh, we also have our um, ADB uh, company email. Uh, so finally today, you know, I want to thank uh, my my speakers, uh, you know, uh, Garrick Hoops, Kathy Jones, and uh, Shilpa Kakate. And uh, with that, um, I want to thank you all for your time. Uh, we're just a little bit over, uh, so I apologize for that. 
Uh, but again, uh, you can uh, you know copies you know you can reach out to us with questions, and again, and uh, copies of this uh, webcast and the slides, uh, we'll be putting those together and notifying you uh, when they will be available. So again, uh, thank you all, and uh, have a great day.